uh, Logic World is the Dice uh, is talking about his experiences with religion, theism, that kind of thing. Um, my experiences have been a little bit weird uh, in that I was raised in a very religious community, but my own family were, if anything, irreligious. We never prayed at home. We never um, did anything religious overtly. We occasionally went to midnight mass for Christmas, but that was more or less just a Christmas tradition, as just about everything having to do with Christmas is these days, even for religious people. Um, but I went to Catholic school, and Catholicism was kind of drummed into our heads as the truth, but at least in my mind, it was something that was sort of I guess I would say it was true. Religion was true when, you know, when I did believe it, what they had to say. But it didn't seem, at least at the beginning, terribly relevant. Religion was something you did when you were at school. Um, beyond that, it didn't really have any reality to me. <clears throat> but I assumed that everything that they taught was true. But I hadn't really thought through the implications of all of this. It's just, okay, if you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. There's good and bad people. Um, you know, there's good and bad everything. Uh, there's the devil and God, and God is wonderful. The devil is horrible. Now, I believed all of that stuff, but I didn't believe it in the same way that, say, somebody who went to church every Sunday and was instructed religiously at home. Um, I just assumed that it was a fact that didn't particularly interest me. Um, you know, okay, I just have to do the minimum possible to avoid hell, and that's about it. Um, but later on, I started to question everything. My parents had no answers. The religion teachers and the priests essentially just punished me every time I asked the wrong questions. Um, and what really sort of drove me off of it, or caused some sort of religious crisis, I guess, crisis of faith, was this idea of the afterlife, believe it or not. He heaven seemed just as horrible as hell because I sort of thought, well, if, you're, if I have the same sort of conception of time as I do now and I'm in a wonderful place forever, <sighs> forever. <sighs> like that, you know, it's like Nietzsche thinking about his own sort of Frankenstein monster slash um, Pygmalion. Um, it may have been a beauty and it may have been terrible, his eternal recurrence. Uh, you're sort of okay with the idea and it's actually wonderful when you think about it in a certain way, but when you think about the eternity of it all, it's pretty terrifying. And that was what started me questioning my faith. If it really ever was faith, uh, what I would call it was probably some sort of a species of knowledge that I just sort of took it all for granted and said that's the way the universe is and I'm not going to worry about that, you know. It just seems to be a no-brainer. I, I, I have to avoid hell, but that's about it. <clears throat> but, you know, the ethical problems, the nihilism built into Christian ethics, the, um, the horrible moral dilemmas that uh, Christianity solves, if you ask me, in a terrible, clumsy, even ghastly way, um, just, uh, you know, eventually just became too much for me and I couldn't reconcile them and I just walked away from it all and I never looked back. Um, my wife is a practicing Christian. She doesn't seem to have any of that stuff inside of her. She's, you know, again, Filipino Christianity is quite different from the variant that you'll see elsewhere. There's almost no guilt involved at all. Um, the assumption is, God is wonderful, everything is good, we're all going to heaven, life is great. <laughs> um, you would think that, look, any Christian would think that, but not necessarily, not when you get into the nuanced arguments or the unintended consequences of the teachings. <clears throat> so I could say that I believed it all very strongly, um, but I didn't really take it seriously, and when I started to take it seriously, I just said, to hell with this. Now, having said that, uh, the Irish Catholic fear of damnation is unbelievably powerful. I've even formed the opinion that it, that the guilt that, that the Irish Catholic Church is so renowned for 
probably predates Christianity. Um, the Romans, when they conquered Britain, they simply couldn't believe the power of the British Druids. Like, what do these priests have over these people? Like, what hold do these extremely warlike, valiant people who are afraid of absolutely nothing, and yet they are abjectly servile to their priests, to the Druids? And I think I understand the hold that the Roman Catholic clergy in Ireland would have held on their flock, and probably hold to this day, would be very similar to the hold that the Druids had on the ancient Celts. Um, to the point where the Romans just decided that they, the only way to control Britain was to kill off every single Druid, which I believe that they did. Um, <clears throat> They, they, they believed that the Druids were what were, what was made, were making Britain ungovernable. Because uh, the Romans believed in all kinds of gods, and they were very tolerant of everybody's religion. They didn't much care as long as the province was kept quiet and the gold kept flowing and slaves and everything else. They didn't care what people believed. Um, but in this case, it was a bit different. They didn't respect local religion. In fact, they decided they were going to destroy it. Um, for that reason, I think. I think that the hold that the Druids had on the minds of the ancient Celts is comparable to the hold that the Roman Catholic clergy uh, exerted over the their flock, I guess you would call it. Um, if you want to understand a lot of the Unionist fear in Northern Ireland, it's that that kind of thing might come to Ulster. Um, Northern Irish anti-Catholicism is something I can honestly understand, even though when you read things like the Reformed or the Free Presbyterian Church website and Ian Paisley and people like that, it almost looks as though they've lost their minds in an anti-Catholic kind of neurosis. But when you look at it through their eyes and through their historical perspective, I can see how someone would actually form the opinion that Irish Catholicism is an anathema. It's, it's, it's a totally horrible thing that robs people of their independence, robs people of their uh, sense of self-respect, sense of dignity, everything. Because no matter what the priests would do, no matter how poor the people were in Ireland, they were slavishly obedient to the priests. Um, and that's a theme throughout Irish history. It kind of repeats itself in countries like Poland or Croatia, um, where the priests are almost a militant order of rabble rousers, I guess you'd call them. I don't know. Just uh, they're the they're the boss of the world, and the the hold that they have over the their adherence is very much one of master to slave uh, and you know they're almost the epitome of the ascetic priest that Nietzsche attacks so severely in, on the genealogy of morals I didn't see any of this I didn't grasp any of this uh, at least not in the way that a lot of people did but I just sort of thought well these priests know what they're talking about so I, I'll just defer to them I was never abused by any Roman Catholic clergy uh, I never had any terribly negative experiences with them, and my break with the church had nothing to do with that. It had more to do with, as I say, just ruminating on what it all meant. Uh, the fact that um, my mother died an atheist, um, and her last contact with the Catholic Church was a nun telling her, okay, you're dying of cancer now, you'd better cleanse your soul or you're going to fucking hell forever. And, I don't know, I guess it being my mother, if I had, if I'd been present in the room when that took place, I might have assaulted the nun. Um, the protective nature of an Irish son towards his mother is renowned as well, and I seem to have inherited that. But, um, as I say, I, I had the idea at that point, uh, and for many years afterwards, uh, not just that... I didn't believe in Catholicism, but I thought that, you know, the clergy were actually bad. <laughs> uh, that the clergy were an evil force in the world, the Roman Catholic clergy. Although I, you know, that got mitigated later on because I sort of met some decent enough clergy and some decent enough people. And I visited countries where the Catholic Church is more or less a 
reasonably positive force. Like if you go to Latin America, it's they're not a guilt is very rarely resorted to, and uh, the priests are more your friend than your boss. They run all the social programs that are to be had in most of Latin America, and they're generally very close to their flocks, which in the European tradition, or not so much the Italian tradition, but say in the Northern European tradition, the priest is somebody who's very remote from you. Not like that in Latin America at all, especially the lower clergy, like the, the friars or Christian, Christian brothers or whatever, they're usually just drawn from exactly the same class as the, the people that they're serving, and usually they've got a girlfriend on the side, which their flock will ignore, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I you know I would look at that and I'd say okay maybe Catholicism isn't a totally horrid thing, but just the implications I think are the same the world over when it comes to Christianity, and I I, I can't see it any other way than the way Nietzsche sees it. Um, having said that, it all depends on the effect that it has on you. It doesn't have a negative effect on my wife at all. My wife just doesn't think about it. To her, religion is something you experience. It's not something that you talk about or analyze or anything like that. It's a, it's an atavistic thing. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I sit sort of respectfully through grace every time she says it. She often forgets. You know, I don't pray along. She knows darn well not to ask me to do that. But, yeah, I, uh, I'm willing to tolerate it. Um, <clears throat> but... It's an interesting thing where, where you can actually believe all of it but not take it seriously to heart until you actually sit and think about it and then that causes a crisis of faith. Um, faith that never really was there in the beginning, I guess, and uh, it basically disappeared once I decided to try and analyze it. Um, and again, the idea of the afterlife and, and the insane moral dilemmas in Christianity drove me away. I said, this is impossible. Um, even at a young age, I probably would have understood what Nietzsche had said about the debt that can never be repaid. Uh, the debt that we owe God as imperfect humans. And it's, it's, the, same, it's the same thing that I always ask people. And I, I, this is one, one of my objections to the uh, antinatalists that I've spoken to. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Uh, the idea that um, guilt phenomenally exists in the universe. That obligation phenomenally exists in the universe. It doesn't. Um, or if it does, you're going to have to prove it to me. You, it's your obligation to prove that to me, that uh, the ought phenomenally exists. And then, and then even if you do sort of raise heaven and earth to, uh, bad metaphor, to prove it to me, I'm going to say, why did you have to explain all that to me? Why, why shouldn't I just know that automatically? Why, like the same way that I sort of know that in, you know, the floor is under my feet right now. Why don't I just know that that obligation exists? Um, there's no answer to that, of course. Uh, it's just, uh, the, you know, you, the argument gets switched over. When, when you start questioning that, people just sort of, the people that are defending that point of view just sort of um, switch around. They sort of turn the tables on you and say, you mustn't ask questions like that, that's forbidden. You know, this is... Um, this is precisely the tendency that has resulted in the resurgence of uh, militant Islam, if you ask me. It has nothing to do with the Muslim religion in and of itself. It just has to do with um, the fact that uh, the blasphemy laws and the blasphemy culture in the Islamic world prevents people from asking the appropriate questions about their faith. Um, so they're unequipped for the big questions, because they've had that sort of inner blind spot inculcated in them, and it's an outer blind spot as well, because you're in trouble the second that you say anything that might rock the boat in most Islamic societies. Uh, they, you know, they, there's reasonable freedom of speech in all of them, believe it or not, but uh, for certain things, absolutely no. You cannot question things on a fundamental level, ever. You can't question anything on a fundamental level there. Um, or else you'll get arrested. And the blasphemy laws will, you know, get you for just about anything that you've done that is rock the boat. <clears throat> um, so, you know, I grew up in a society that didn't have blasphemy laws. I, it, there was a blasphemy culture that I grew up in, but you know, it's easy enough to overcome in Canada where most people are irreligious or even people that go to church generally. It's not something all that serious. 
Um, but um, I can see how an inability to question things, even if it's something that's inculcated into you, could stunt your ability to get out of that box, to get out of that religious box. Um, Orwell's term for it was crime think, thought crime, or no, sorry, crime stop, where you have just this idea or this mechanism implanted in your brain that you're, you know, metaphorically speaking, that just keeps you from thinking along certain lines. And I think that a lot of religious people have that. You just don't go there. That's forbidden. That is haram. That is, um, you know, we, we just don't go there with, with those thoughts. That's where Satan is. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I abandoned the religion very early in my adult life, I guess. Um, the ethics kept with me, though, afterwards, even though I didn't realize it. Um, and uh, Christian ethics are not quite so easy to get around, especially when you come from a society where the entire thrust of ethics is religious in origin. But again, you you think it through, and you you deal with the with the um, implications of it all as bravely as you can, and. You know, you go on. You you you, you just uh, keep at it until you've more or less worked it out in your head. And um, my philo my discovery of Eastern philosophy actually helped de-Christianize me. And I've never been in any danger of actually embracing any of the Eastern philosophies. Although I wear an ohm around my neck, and I have uh, you know I do Eastern meditation and everything. And, you know, um, but you know I could even be convinced to sort of um, use the image of a god in meditation in the way that the Hindus will do it. And a lot of Hindus will tell you, I don't believe in the god that I worship. What? Yeah, but he, he, he exists for me, or she, or whatever, exists for me because it's a necessary part of my life. But if nobody else believes in that god, it's irrelevant to me. Yeah, that's the way Hindus think, actually, about their gods. Um, which is why I don't think that atheism or skepticism is likely to make any great inroads among um, at least free-thinking Hindus, and there's an awful lot of free-thinking Hindus, and you can tell that there always has been a lot of free-thinking Hindus, simply because of the amount of revolutionary thought that has always come out of that country, and continues to come out of that country. Or at least that civilization, I guess we should call it. Um, <clears throat> so that was my religious background. Um, and that was my walking away from it all. Um, I was walking away from, I believe, people pointing to rules and regs and, and laws and stuff that I couldn't see any evidence for. It's the same thing when I say, well, why do why, why you want me to bow down before logic? Logic is no more real than God is. Um, or you want me to bow down before the physical universe, which I don't even know if it's actually there. Um, I know a lot about myself. Uh, a lot of what I think I know about myself is misleading, but at least I've learned it firsthand. Whereas all this other stuff that people have to teach me, um, anything that has to be taught, I'm suspicious of. Um, I think you can use teaching and education to bring things out, but as for whether or not it can actually Anything that, that can be that, that needs to be taught is dicey for me. Um, as I say, even things that are actually seemingly solid may not be, i.e., the physical universe. Um, at least we have non-verbal evidence that it's real. All the stuff that you have to argue, hmm, tough. Um, again, if it if it just is. Why do we need to discuss it? Why do we need to talk about it? Uh, we wouldn't have to if it was just the way things are. Unless, of course, as they say, we've been deliberately duped for thousands of years. I don't believe religion is a conspiracy. I think religion is something that may have been exploited conspiratorially throughout human history and massively exploited. But I don't believe that at at bottom, it's an actual conspiracy. I think it's a way to explain things for people that don't really like to think. <laughs> That's kind of Nietzsche too, isn't it?